Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to shed forth your word, to shed forth that which you would have us to know and to hear and to have implanted in our souls, Lord. We be no better than some of our computer boxes, Lord, that need chips changed every now and then. Lord, we just ask that your truth would come and replace any bad chips in us. Rewrite any encoding from the past, Lord. Change anything in us, Lord, that needs to be altered. We just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be submitted to your word and to grow a little bit further. Lord, I ask that you would not only anoint this message, of course, clarify this message, but also, Lord, uh, help me to deliver this message in exact timing. And I thank you, Lord, for all the truth and all the references. I ask, Lord, for not only your words and your mind, but also your precision. In Jesus' name, amen. Multiply the bread, O Lord. I like that line. Multiply the bread. Okay. Praise the Lord. Today's message from your messenger, serving the one who gives messages, who is our messenger, who follows the one who gives messages, because he's the original messenger. Here is your message. Title. Be ye followers. Be ye followers. No, I'm not going to re-preach the message called Ye Are Soldiers, Get Over It. I assume you've already adapted that into yourself. <coughs> we already know that you are a follower a believer, a saint, a sanctified, a separated. But you know, sometimes we need to have a good reminder of why following is important, why following is useful. And we need to be reminded that following is uh, inevitable. The very first thing I want to say as a preface to this message is you were created to follow. Do you know that? Do you know how I know you were created to follow? You want proof? Everybody want proof to be proof. The proof is in Genesis chapter 3. Lord God said, Lord God said, Lord God said, don't do, do, don't do. And it was very good. <laughs> From the very beginning, Adam is instructed to follow. From the very beginning, he is addressed not as an autonomous creation who gets to do whatever he pleases, but is addressed as one which is created by a creator within a creation that he must carry out actions within according to that which God has given him. Go garden. Go till. Don't touch. Do touch. Here, have a wife. You see where I'm going? And he numbers all the and names all the animals too. From the very beginning, Adam did not have the concept of I'm my own boss, I'm my own self, I stand alone, and I'm a god unto no man. <gasps> uh, <clears throat> sorry, moved a little forward in time there. And Eve did not walk around the garden going, I'm a goddess, I'm a goddess. That's what I am. I'm a goddess. <laughs> they did not have the concept of disobedience until one day somebody came along and said, why are you following him? Follow me. They were created to follow and the choice was going to be very quickly, whom are you following? When you stop to consider everything that's happened to the human race since that time, and if you consider this entire book right here, this is a book about following or not following. We don't like thinking about the word following. We don't 
like to think of ourselves as servants, slaves, disciples. We like to think of ourselves as anointed saints, separated unto the Lord, used of God. And those are true points, but they're all predicated on the beginning <coughs> of following. The point of this message is to give you some uh, scriptural awareness of what we follow, what was followed, what we should follow, why it should be followed. And hopefully I'll do that in a fast and furious manner because I have lots of references tied to it. <laughs> with that in mind, I'd like to start with the very first example I could think of this morning when I woke up. If we are followers, what do we follow? Well, you go to the Old Testament and you find out that there were followers of a fiery cloud. Followers of a fiery cloud. Exodus 13, verses 20 to 22. Mm. See, I did it again. I was afraid this might happen because I wrote references down this time instead of printing my verses. I do this sometimes. I type wrong. Exodus 13, 20 to 22. 20 to 22. Oh, there it is. I'm just reading wrong. If you catch me on a wrong reference, help me to find it later. But I had a couple of times where I was fat fingered and I realized that I was going typing in the wrong numbers. Fingers do what they want sometimes. Exodus 13, 20 to 22. And they took up their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Israel is just starting out in its relationship with God. They're just beginning to be free of Egypt. And the first thing they've got to turn around and do is follow. <laughs> Yay, I'm free from slavery. I'm free from this world. I'm free. I'm born again free. And the very next sentence comes, now, follow this. But, 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 but I was free. Yes, you are free. The freedom is in what you're following. When you're following the pillar of cloud and fire, you're now in a relationship that is different than the relationship of following as a slave to Pharaoh. You have to understand that in both cases you were following. In both cases you were surrendered. In both cases you have to do what you're told. And the flesh doesn't always like that. But like I said, from the beginning we were created to follow. Behold, a man is going to become as one of us, either good or evil. And he's not going to do it by himself. He's going to become as one of us, good or evil. We will either have man made in our likeness and image, or we will see man made in your likeness and image. Look. So from the beginning... Israel, being set free by the power of God, does not start making up their own mind to try to figure out where they're going, what they're going to do, who they're going to conquer, why they're going to go conquer it. And the mixed multitude don't get to have a voice. And the captains of industry don't get to have a voice. And all those tribal leaders who were head of their family clans don't get to have a voice. You have to put yourself in perspective. The descendants of Abraham don't get a vote. Moses speaks, they move. Cloud speaks, they move. Who gets a vote? Following the pillar of cloud and fire is a nice way of saying following something a lot bigger than you. Following something that can direct you. Why do we follow the pillar of cloud and fire? Because the pillar of cloud and fire is awesome. It's mighty. 
You need to realize that when God directs his people and he shows himself, he is also simultaneously giving what I would call an audiovisual lesson. If he wanted to, he could have materialized as a flower. <laughs> if he wanted to, he could materialize as, you know, a floating rock. He could materialize and do whatever he wants in any form he wants. But he chooses imagery to show us something. These things are written for our examples. These things are written for us to be able to draw some inference from and say, hmm, historical narrative, however, personal application. The pillar of fire and cloud stands there as a testimony against the world, I will judge you, and as a protection to the saints, I will cover you. But it does not mean that you're free to do as you please. The pillar of cloud and fire is going to direct them by day and keep them warm by night. That's pretty awesome. It might be pretty cold out there in the wilderness at night. I honestly believe they got heated up by that cloud, by that fire. It's very cold in the desert at night. They didn't have a thousand campfires at first. They grabbed some stuff. They hauled some stuff off, but they still had some growing to do in it. Because you're basically talking about people who hit and ran. They hit the kingdom of Pharaoh and they ran. And they really didn't have time to make sure everything was perfectly put together. They had a night to get it together, pack it up, and let's get it moving. And let's move it really fast. I think the pillar of cloud by day is a way of saying, you know what? No matter how vast this wilderness looks to you, I'm right here. You can't miss me. I'm big, I'm powerful, I'm here. The penalty, as it were, for that is, I'm big, I'm powerful, I'm here. <laughs> you can try to walk around me, you can try to ignore me, you can try to see me some other way, and you'll find out I'm big, I'm powerful, and I'm here. Pharaoh thinks he's going to be able to chase after my saints and buck me. He's in for a surprise. Because I'm big, and I'm powerful, and I'm here. Exodus 14 19 to 25. And the angel of the Lord, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all <coughs> the night. Now that's interesting. Stop for that second. Light to us, dark to them. When you're following the pillar of fire and cloud, your adversary cannot see where you're at to assault you. Christians have the concept that the devil can hit you anytime he wants. No, he can't. There is a time where God may allow, and there's a time where they can't find you. Your number is not found. There are people that believe that because you have flesh and you will always be flesh, that they will always find every aspect of your flesh. No, they won't. Because the Lord is not going to put more upon you than you're able to bear. And they can't find that yet. That's why you can get away with having some problems for a while. The Lord gives you a little chance to work it out. Don't seem to be under tremendous assault for being out of line. And then all of a sudden something sniffs around and bite your ankle. <laughs> well, it never bit me before. It was always fine before. I didn't see any consequences before. There was no cause and effect before. There was no sowing and reaping before. Yeah, that's because the pillar was darkening their eyes. But now, you got to get rid of it. If bitten, sign and evidence that you should be summoning the fire part of the cloud now, not the concealed part of the cloud. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, made the sea dry land, and divided the waters. The children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. The waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians said to themselves, Aha! Now we've got them trapped! Chase them! <laughs> they can't turn left, they can't turn right. And they're not going to make very fast progress going forward. So oh, we got chariots, man. Come on, they're on foot. Let's do it. 
That's what I call a Holy Ghost sucker punch. They're trapped. Go ahead, chase them. <laughs> the Lord has surely uncovered them. You see, before they couldn't see them because the cloud blocked them in darkness. Now they can see them. They're in the water. We can trap them. We can go after them. Hey, if they can walk on the land, we can walk on the land, right? Right? If a man of God can do it, we can do it, right? If the body of Christ can do it, we of the world can do this, right? Uh, uh, uh. No, no. You try to cast out a demon in the name of Paul whom preached Christ, and you're liable to get yourself thrown out of a room. Because the miracle that's for us is not for them. Because when you follow the pillar of cloud and fire, you're following something that's going to defend you. The Egyptians pursued, went in after in the midst of the sea, even all of Pharaoh and his horses, his chariots and his horsemen. Came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. Hmm. What do you guys think you're doing? That's really kind of a great imagery. You know, hiding here, the angel Lord hiding in this fire. Yeah. We'll get to the next section here shortly, followers of the burning bush. This is just a bigger burning bush. That's all this is. And the angel looks out. Now, I wonder what the Pharaoh saw. Now, remember, these are idol worships. They, they are used to the idea that their gods can look out through the windows of heaven and stare at them. I wonder if they really did see them. <laughs> I wonder if that fire pulled back and a pair of eyes just went. You know what I'm saying? I'm wondering if in every heart all of a sudden there was this, what was that? I don't know, the cloud moved. It has a face in it. Why would fire have a face in it? I don't know. But it's looking at us, and I don't like the way it looks. There are illusions when we look at the clouds. We see fat formations and so forth. You know, we see a horse, we see a this, we see a that. Now, those are just our illusions. This was the Lord going, peek a -boo, I see you. <laughs> and troubled the host of the Egyptians, took off their chariot wheels. Oh, that's catchy. That's catchy. You know what that tells me? I'm conjecturing. Allow me some conjecture. The servant of Elisha saw angels all around the hills. I am conjecturing that when that wall of water went up, there was a lineup of angels on either side of it. And when the chariots went right down the middle, the angels just went and yanked the wheels right off. Just took them right off the hinge pins. And the chariots go plunk. And from there in, you're ground to a halt. So who's trapped who, where, how? If you're following the pillar of cloud and fire, you can be guaranteed that your adversary will follow you. Guaranteed. But if he is, it's for his destruction, not yours. If you feel like the adversary is behind you as you're coming out of this world, you're coming into salvation, you're coming into your Christian walk, you've been in your Christian walk for a while, and you're coming across, and all of a sudden your enemy's chasing you harder than he ever was before, guaranteed his wheels are going to come off. That's the faith you should have because you're following the pillar of cloud and fire. You are not following yourself. You are not following an ideology. You're not following a good idea. And contrary to what the world teaches, you are not following a myth. Numbers 14. Numbers 14, verses 13 to 20. Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up these people in thy might from among them. Yep, that's what he did, in his might. And they will tell in the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face. And thy cloud standeth over them, and thou goest before them by day time, in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if thou shalt kill all this people as one man... Then the nations which have heard of the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land, which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. Now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord God be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. 
the pillar of cloud and fire has been leading these guys from Egypt till this very moment when all of a sudden God, in a private conversation with Moses, is saying, I've had it. These guys have barked, <coughs> barked, argued, fussed, fumed, murmured, complained. They fight about you. They fight about me. They fight about wishing they could go back and have leeks and garlics. But he never let the pillar of cloud and fire go. There was a point where God could have just simply said, that's it, I'm done. I'm moving my cloud. He could have just stopped showing up one morning and left them sitting in the wilderness while they were in rebellion, while they were in discord, while they were in disunity, while they were doing things they shouldn't have been doing with their blah, 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 blah device. You know, this is the blah, 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 blah device. We should never say that, blah, 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 blah. You should say something intelligent. When God looked down and said, I see these people, I see how they are constantly bucking you, constantly bucking me, and yet here I am standing, I'm still watching over them, I'm still taking care of them. But you know, I can only put up with so much of this rebellion, and now I'm going to come down, and I'm going to wipe them. Because I can do that, because here's the issue. Be ye followers. There comes a place in God's own heart where he looks down at people and he says, you're not following me. But they were following him, weren't they? They were following the pillar of cloud and fire. They went everywhere it went. They could honestly say in their hearts, no, we've been following. But just because your Christian walk seems to be following after the pillar of cloud does not necessarily mean your inner man is. And if the inner man is in opposition to God, then your outer man following is likely to be in trouble. The pillar of cloud and fire says to us, I'm bigger than you and now you're ignoring me. <laughs> he says to the man of God, let me wipe them out. I'll start over. I'll use you. Mm -hmm. Moses says, well, let's have a discussion about your nature first. You said, you said, you said, you said, you said, you said, you said. Is a good response against God coming to say, I'm judging. A lot of Christians think, hey, judgments is coming, judgments is coming. Keep if you ray. Well, you better watch out because you might be standing in line. Because when judgments are coming, they don't tend to hit only specifically. You know, that whole region's a mess and judgments are coming. Yeah, and you're living in that place. And the ripple effect. Think for a moment of the ripple effect of 9-11 on our nation. I'm not the one that lost any relatives. I'm not the one that had anybody I knew bombed. I'm not the one who... I'm not even in that state. And the fallout is on us. Now imagine for a moment the fallout when God judges. See, Moses considered the fallout. He said, no, Lord, don't do that. If you do that, here's the fallout. These nations will say that you brought us up out of that nation in order to slay us. And that's going to damage the whole future of what you're working on. Now you say, God wasn't stupid. He didn't do that not knowing. But he has to have a man to stand in the gap against judgment. Even if the people deserve it. The pillar of cloud and fire is demonstration I can mop up entire nations. I wiped out e Egypt. I can wipe out you. Don't follow, and there is penalty. But mercy overrides judgment. And what he says is, you're the one who said, according as thou hast spoken, saying, the Lord is long-suffering and great of mercy. That is what God had told Moses earlier on, was to be his understanding. That when he declared, it is the I am that's coming to tell you to set you free, he also came saying, and I am a God of mercy. The pillar of cloud and fire stands there as the visible leading of God, but the voice of the Lord talking to Moses <coughs> is the invisible leading of God. Let's move on. Followers of the burning bush. Exodus 3, 1-6. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the backside of the desert, came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. 
The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked up, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why this bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, saying, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Draw not, not, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. The burning bush example, to me, is a good example of what do you do when the Holy Ghost first pricks you on something, gets your attention on something. We love the manifestations of God's Spirit. We love thinking about the manifestations of God's Spirit. But when He manifests, the very next thing behind that is going to be instruction in righteousness, admonition, correction, that which we need, direction. Which means that it's not just there to be nice. It's there because a the work's going to be done. The manifestation of the burning bush stands as a type to us to pay attention when God speaks in a mystery. See, what he said was, Moses saw the burning bush, and then he said to himself, what's this? He got Moses' curiosity. Now, Moses could have passed right by that burning bush. You've got to see the importance of that. The burning bush is God's subtler way of drawing you aside. He says, hi, here I am, pay attention. And when he sees Moses turn, then he starts to talk to him. I wonder how many times the presence of the Lord has come down upon us. How many times, as it were, the fiery bush has materialized in our spiritual prayer times. And we go right by it, sure. announcing our needs or doing whatever we do, or instead of turning aside and saying, what is this you're doing? Because God is trying to draw the heart. He's not trying to break it. He's trying to put as it were, a bit in our mouth, and move the horse. He's not trying to beat the horse into submission. Moses drew aside and drew nigh unto God. And the New Testament says, you draw nigh to God, God draws nigh to you. But he started the drawing. He set you up for the coming. The first thing that God says out of a burning bush is, I'm the God of. When God starts doing things upon you that are miraculous in nature, you will find that he will always give his credentials. I'm the God of. He'll either quote your references, he'll point you apostles and disciples, he'll remind you of teachings that you were taught by good men of God. He will demonstrate who he is to the one who is supposed to do his task. We won't have to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, be afraid and have to discern so, so difficultly as we are right now. We are so nervous trying to discern. What we really should be praying is, Lord, up the heat. Increase the burning bush. Don't just give me a burning bush with a little flame on it. Go ahead, fry the bush. Let me be drawn in by the mystery of God. Let me be drawn in by the mysteries you've created. Go ahead and manifest yourself in a way I've never seen you before. A lot of religious people say, well, God wouldn't do that. He never did it before. Well, he'd never done a burning bush thing before Moses either. Because it's the nature of God to set up a mystery and draw us. It's bait. It's bait. We, the school of fish, are just going by minding our own business. And he throws out bait. We decide whether or not we're going to take it. We choose to follow our curiosity so that we'll follow to the bush, so that we'll follow what comes out of the bush, so that when we turn around to Israel and say, follow me, which is what Moses later did, the whole time he's saying, follow me, in his mind, he's seeing a burning bush. He's seeing an event with his hand turned to leprosy and his hand unturned to leprosy. He's seeing a time when the voice of the Lord spoke. He knows the voice of the Lord. He's looking in his mind to who he's following while he's telling somebody else to follow. We're always worried about being leaders. 
what we should worry about is being really good followers, all of us. God will determine who follows who. Ever watch a bunch of ducks in a row going across a road or a bunch of geese? They don't have a problem following. See them flying in the sky? They don't have a problem following in a V formation. They know exactly how to follow. God has put it into our hearts to know how to follow. We have to yield to that following. Hebrews 12, 28. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. I think it's significant that the, Hebrew, the writer of the book of Hebrews is banking off of the typology of the Old Testament. And he's saying, look, our God's a consuming fire. You bring in a vessel or a strange fire into the tabernacle, what do you get? Fried. What do you get if you come out of Egypt and you're not, you're not following the Lord? Toast. Our God is a consuming fire. What is the lake of fire described as as fire for? Whatever you want to do with it, it is a consuming fire and represents God himself. And he will judge. We walk before him with godly fear and reverence. Moses quaked. Moses hit the ground. But Israel got arrogant and stuffy. They had no idea how close they came to being wiped out that day. They had no idea. There are probably some churches that are still running today that because the man of God in the middle of the room or the woman of God in the middle of the room said, No, Lord, please, don't let this place be destroyed yet. <clears throat> There's probably some nations that still exist right now because, as it were, the Spirit of Christ said, Let me go dung around that tree one more time. Don't chop it down yet. The intercessors have a very important responsibility. The spiritual priesthood has a responsibility to make sure that we are executing our prayers correctly. And mercy is always the first rule. Next category. Followers of the man of God. We should be followers of men of God. It was that way in the Old Testament. It is that way in the New Testament. Exodus 4, 1-9. Moses said, Behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. The Lord said, And what's in your hand? A rod. Cast it to the ground. Cast it to the ground, and became a serpent. Moses fled from before it. Yeah, I would too. The Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, take it by the tail. He put forth his hand, caught it, and it became a rod. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, has appeared unto thee. The Lord said, Furthermore, and put now thine hand in thy bosom. He put his hand in his bosom, and we took it out. Behold, his hand was leprous as snow. He said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. He put his hand in his <coughs> bosom again, plucked it out of his bosom. Behold, it was turned again as the other flesh, his other flesh. And it came to pass, and it shall come to pass, excuse me, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take the water of the river, pour it on the dry land, and so forth, etc., 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 and so forth, and so on. The signs confirming the word. See, Moses was right in saying, it's very difficult for people to discern when they say, the Lord told me this, whether or not the Lord really told you that. That's okay. The reason for the signs and the wonders is to back up what God is performing. So when we say followers of the man of God, what we're really saying is followers of the man of God is going to demonstrate very clearly that he's a follower of God. We're not followers of the man. We are followers of the man who is of God. We have to keep in perspective that all following is predicated on who's following who. If the man or the woman is following God and they are demonstrating that which God has told them to demonstrate, we should not be afraid to follow. We should be afraid to follow kings and monarchs who are not. 
But, admittedly, we have to go before the Lord and ask Him, because sometimes God's doing invisible works, not blatant, visible, you know, snake to rod, rod to snake type stuff. Sometimes we have to ask the Lord point blank, do I follow this one or not? There was a time in my life where I had to make a choice about following a man of God. A man walked up to me and said, Oh no, you're near that one? No, 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 get away, get away, danger, danger. And somebody else said, No, 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 good man of God, good man of God. And I was a Baptist, I didn't know one thing or another. And I went before God and I said, I gotta know. Man of God or not? Want me to follow him or not? Am I supposed to do this or not? What do I do? Now, I was a novice and I knew that. And so should you. We've been around for ages, some of us. <laughs> the man of God will be confirmed with signs following. God answered my prayer that day. Actually, he answered the, the following weekend, rather blatantly. I had no question after that. I had no problem following a man of God, any of them. Do you? See? But a lot of the church does. They're always sitting there scrutinizing, scrutinizing, scrutinizing. And the problem is, they're going to be looking for the man's flesh to determine whether or not you should follow the man of God. Oh no, that Moses, you can't follow him. He smote the rock twice. He's a disobedient one. I think I'd rather follow Moses, the merciful one, who said unto, said unto um, God, you know, have mercy on these people. And just not pay attention to that whoopsie slip stuff. The man of God will con come with signs following. You need to pray for more signs and wonders following. If you be a man of God, if you be a woman of God, if you be an intercessor of God, if you be a handmaiden of the Lord, then you should be asking the Lord to back up what you're doing. And if you're just speaking your own mind and your own ideas and your own opinions, none of us really need to follow you. We might still like you, but we don't necessarily have to follow you. <coughs> the issue here is, Follow what is safe to follow. If you try to follow that which is not safe, you lose. Numbers 12. I actually wrote down the whole section for this. Numbers 12, 1 to 16. But I'm going to scrap from it. I'm going to pull from it a little bit. This is the story of Aaron and Miriam thinking they is somebody. Prophets of God. Bucking God's prophet. And it says that Moses was very meek, in verse 3, above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And Moses and Aaron seemed to be, excuse me, Moses and, uh, pfft, Miriam and Aaron seemed to be a little bit more forceful. Your, your type, what is it, A personality? I don't know. And so they're boldly coming in against the man who was really meek. Well, you know why the man was really meek? Because once upon a time, he was really forceful and slew an Egyptian and learned his lesson after 40 years on a burning bush and a few things. Now he's like really meek. So how does that get interpreted? Uh, well, that's an awful quiet prophet. Maybe we need to convince him. Beware of the quiet prophets. They come in, they make their to-do. The Lord comes down and he says, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, ooh, oh dear, don't start with an if statement. You pointed us, we're prophets. Ah, well, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make him, myself known unto him in vision, and I will speak to him in a dream. My servant is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold interesting term, similitude of the Lord. Just keep that in mind. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Right. See, followers of the man of God have to have a certain understanding of respect. It's one thing to be a Berean and to look at and weigh and analyze. It's another thing to touch God's anointed. To try to do his prophet's harm. To try to exalt oneself against a calling. If it's not your calling, don't touch it. If it is your calling, if you're a prophet among the prophets, then you get to speak with the prophets like a prophet. However, even this lesson says there are degrees of prophets. Careful who you're dealing with. Say, so, well, this is all Old Testament. This applies to the New Testament. Of course it does. 
Because every commission is unique. You go read your First Corinthians passage. Every member of the body gets its function from the Holy Ghost as he dispenses it according to his will. That means we're not all doing the same level of anything. So I will be careful not to tread upon or oppose or be haughty against another man of God. Even if he's only had one miracle every two years. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If he's had a miracle of the Lord and God's backed him up with a sign and a wonder, eh, careful. Not saying humans can't make mistakes. Moses made some mistakes. Paul made some mistakes. But you still, before God, as a follower, follow. It's an important thing to realize that following keeps you safe, even though you're dealing with human beings. Joshua 22, 1-6. Joshua called the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, said unto them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. That's his opening line. Who can you trust? Leaders are always looking to see who they can trust. Do they trust the man who's always bucking him? Or do they trust the ones that seem to be true followers? Ye have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but you have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. See, you followed Moses, you followed me, and you followed the commandment of the Lord. This is right and proper. Now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren as he promised them. Therefore now return ye, get ye into your tents, into the land of your possession, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side of Jordan. Come ye into the reward, faithful servants. Faithful servants have a right to those rewards. Take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses the servant of the Lord charged you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to cleave unto him, to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. Now I'm sorry, where does that leave room for what about me? The what about me question gets answered in the following what about him. He will take care of you. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went to their tents. The blessing of the Lord comes upon those who know correctly who they're following and why. Oops. Second Kings 1, 7-15 And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? This is a, a heathen ruler getting a report back of a message that had been sent to him, basically telling the king, Shut up and go away. And the king said, Who said that? Okay. And they answered him, He was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishvite. Oh, great. We know our prophets by their clothing now. <laughs> what was his name? I don't know. He was wearing leather clothing. Oh, not him again. Oh, no. Not the guy with the strange fedora hat. Oh, no. Not the guy with the unusual, you know. John the Baptist shows up, you know. Locust and honey is his meat. Oh, it's the guy that's always coming out of the wilderness with locusts and honey. Uh-oh. See... You know, the presence of the prophet is it where goes before the prophet. <laughs> the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, went to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill, probably praying, having a wonderful worship time when these idiots intruded. And he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. Ooh, don't you love it when the cops show up? Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God... Then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee in thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. 
Again also he sent to him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and he said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. ASAP. <laughs> and Elijah answered and said unto him, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee in thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him in his fifty. Now about now I'm thinking of Ananias and Sapphira standing in front of a very humble man called an apostle, having a little discussion over a money matter, and... Well, you know, yeah, but he's a head. Yeah, okay, so he's an apostle, but you know, he's not all knowing. And I'm pretty sure that he won't know that we did this. Because after all, you know, we changed our mind. Why hast thou lied against the Holy Ghost? You're dead. See, right now, we're not very fearful of the men of God because they're not manifesting enough of, whoops, the Lord showed up and took care of it himself. We're doing a lot of this church government correcting stuff. You know, put them out the door. Let them dry out for 12 months outside, then bring them back in, and then throw them back out, and then bring them back in, and throw them back out. And, you know, we kind of do the, you know, spiritual prison jail sentence thing. Excommunicate, don't talk anymore. That's what excommunicate means. Don't talk to them anymore. You know, I'm ex cathedral, you're excommunicate. But the truth of the matter is, there's a day coming when prophets are going to stand up and say things that are going to really have some real kick behind them. At least in the cause and effect department, when a prophet walks up and says, you know, you really need to take care of this. And all I'm going to say to you is the effect you won't want. There's not going to be no fire come down from heaven. You're going to drop dead tomorrow morning because I said it. It's going to be closer to God walking up to Adam and say, don't eat of the tree, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And Adam ate of the tree, and he didn't surely die. So it seemed. Sometimes the fire coming down upon the fifty is invisible. He sent unto again a captain of, a, of the third fifty with his fifty, and the third captain of the fifty went up and came down, came and fell down on his knees before Elijah. Now you see, haughty spirits come. Hey, you! Come here! Hey, yes, I pee! This guy's going like, maybe I can avoid this if I do the crawl on my face thing. A wise leader. He just saw his boss get demoted and all of his org chart. And then he saw his boss's underlings who became a boss demoted and all of his org chart. And now he's going, uh, okay, not going to come in with the same approach. O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in their sight. Please don't fry us. Behold, there came down fire from heaven and burned up the two captains of the former fifties who were their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. Now, why did he have to fry a hundred folks? And then turn around and tell Elijah, Go ahead and go anyway. The answer to that is, because until the attitude was right, the message wasn't going to be received. There's no need for the prophet to show up when everybody's got corks in their ears. If you're not going to follow the man of God, why should he show up on your doorstep? If you want to call out for the presence of God and you're not willing to be under it, why should he show up? Will he not surely fry your flesh if he does? You say, oh, but I'm as good as that man of God. Oh, really? Put your hand in your bosom and pull it out and see what happens. What I'm trying to say here is I think God was by the types and shadows trying to give us a forewarning. Think, this is Old Testament. If this which is Old Testament was recompensed this way, what's the penalty for bucking Paul? And three quarters of the New Testament hereby written. If he be a man of God, we better follow every bit of his books. <laughs> Second Kings. Uh, no, no. Uh, First Kings, seventeen. This is the case of a of a woman and a sick kid. She says unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, thou man of God? 
Art thou come unto me to call my sin into remembrance and to slay my son? He said unto her, Give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom, carried him up into a loft where he abode, and laid him upon his bed. Cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? Here was a blessing of the Lord and it's dead. What, are you really that mad with us that now you're killing off the blessings you gave us? It's a fair question to ask sometimes. He stretched himself upon the child three times, cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. Boy, that's insight for an Old Testament saint. And he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down out of the chamber into the house, and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, and this is the kicker, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. You are the prophet of God. You are the man of God. And I now know that what you're telling me is also true. Whenever the signs and wonders back up the word, the immediate response is, uh-oh, now I'm believing. If you go to Corinthians and look about prophecy, and a man prophesies and speaks something that is absolutely dead accurate, the first response on the inside becomes a, uh-oh, maybe God is with you. Maybe you are a man of God, woman of God. Maybe you really are a handmaid of the Lord. That is the correct response to and from followers. She just needed a little more convincing. So if the Lord allowed her son to die, that it might be to the glory of God, like the disciple scenario with Jesus, and though this is not because of their sin, but to the glory of God, I'll convince you. Hey, I'll let people die if I have to, to convince you. <laughs> Our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. The object is to produce righteous followers. God uses men of God, but he also uses himself to make that an event. We are followers of the God, of the man of God. Let me read you a little bit about Caleb real quick. Interesting passage on Caleb. Numbers 14. Numbers 14, 20 to 24. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, for as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Remember our message from last time? Mm -hmm. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Keep that in mind from last time. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, have tempted me thou these ten times. Hmm. And have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that <coughs> provoked me see it. Rule number one. Spiritual experiences do not go to the disobedient. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. My servant Caleb was a follower of me, he says. Well, Caleb was following Moses. Caleb went in and saw the land, and came back with the report that God wanted brought back. The report of faith. And because of the report of faith and following, he received the land. Numbers 32, 10, and 13, 10 to 13 goes with this. And the Lord's anger was kindled the same time, and he swear, saying, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt, from twenty years old and upward, 
shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord's anger was against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years, until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. Now there's a lesson here. Look around at the church world. And you say to yourself, looks like the church is in for some chastisement. Looks like the church is in for some judgment. Looks like the church is in for. But that doesn't necessarily mean you will be if you have been a follower. There is no need for God to bring judgment or even correction, chastisement, if you're following. You follow God, you follow the man of God, and he looks down and he says, you're right in line where you're supposed to be. As it were, the fire is going to run on your left side, run on your right side, and not touch you. You can have absolute confidence in that. Mary said, I am thy handmaiden, as the Lord desires. So be it. Easy do. Following is not painful. Following is not painful. Some of the fallout, because we follow, might be. Maybe some persecution, maybe some people looking at us weird. But following will keep you safe from what's coming against those who do not follow. Caleb and Joshua got land, prosperity, blessing, increase, got to live an extra 40 years while everybody else around them croaked, Got to train up the next generation. That's pretty obvious. Got the blessing Moses didn't even get. He had to go up to Mount Nebo and die. And all of that because they were followers. First Corinthians 10 makes this interesting statement and is our next category, but keep it in mind in what we're talking about. First Corinthians 10, verse 1. And following. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. <clears throat> it's a spiritual type. And did eat of the same spiritual food, or meat. Did drink, all the drink, the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they lusted after. Not idolaters, not fornicators, not uh, uh, those two categories where judgments took place. He says, Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Verse 10. All these things happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him think, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. This rock, they were followers of the rock in type. They were followers of the spirit in type. They drank of the miracle waters that God supplied out of the rock. They were baptized in the ocean and rescued from their enemies as a type. From God's perspective, that was a baptism. From God's perspective, that was the beginning of mankind in a baby step partaking of God, which are examples to us of what we should be doing and being careful of, because we are now followers of the rock. Matthew 7.24 
Therefore, whoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. Rains descend, floods come, winds blow, beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. It came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. To the soul in Israel who bucked against the rock in the Old Testament, they died in the wilderness. And those who buck against the rock in the New Covenant will just have their house destroyed. But let's flip it to the positive. Those who followed the rock in the Old Testament, living out that little baby step of typology, walked into mass blessing and a future in Abraham's bosom. Those who stand and build their house on the rock in the New Covenant, when the storms come around, are protected. This is the message God keeps giving over and over and over and over. Well, why should you be so special? The world would cry out to the Christian. What makes you think you're so special to think you get to go to heaven and I don't? It's really simple. I follow, you don't. Mm -hmm. Why won't you follow? Well, I just don't think. Well, that's right. You don't think. Well, it just seems to me. Well, that's the problem. You're using your brain again. The issue here is I don't use my brain. I use his brain. I believe his word. I follow his thoughts. I want to do what he wants. To the degree I do that, blessing follows me. To the degree I don't do that, I run the risk of bleaching my bones in a wilderness spiritually or otherwise. To the degree I preach this message, we'll get done with it. To the degree I don't, we won't. Okay. I'm following the tenor of this message. I'm never going to make it to the end of it. We're going to probably have a two-part message. Followers of the angels. Do you know we follow angels? We even follow angels. Let's start with Genesis 22, 10 to 18. Genesis 22. Abraham. Verse 10, stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son, which God had commanded him to do. And the angel of Yahweh called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is to this day. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, or the Lord will see. The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of the heaven the second time and said, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. The follower, Abraham, who's following God and obeying angels, who are messengers of God, we can talk about 
So the angel lured another time in a different way. Take it at face value. That man gets the promise that his seed will be the one that all the nations submit to. And that seed is Christ. But it's also a blessing of mass proportions. Because it also says he gets to have a blessing of multiplication like the stars in the sand. I'm going to be real interested to see when that's fulfilled. When will it be fulfilled that Abraham's seed gets to possess so much and be so large that it's like sand on a seashore in quantity? Right now we look at the seed of Abraham and we don't see that great a quantity. But I've been paying attention to it and thinking, you know, it keeps growing. It's like a weed underneath the carpet, as it were of society. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it just keeps growing. Get stomped, grow some more. Get stomped, grow some more. At what point will this promise be fulfilled? Hasn't happened yet. But Abraham is long dead. And yet it's called Abraham's bosom, where people went, according to Christ. See, Abraham was faithful to the voice of the angel and faithful to the voice of the Lord and he never doubted it. And so there's one thing we learned from Abraham is he's a follower. He stopped immediately. Now you have to understand that God gave him that son. It's so important we understand that God gave him that son. If God gives you a gift and then he says, give it back to me, you know what your only right response would be? Is to give it back to him. He might give it back to you after you gave it back to him, or he might not give it back to you after you gave it back to him. Because he's going to want to know, what's more important to you? The gift I gave you, or me? You get a test like that, who do you love? Do you love me, or do you love the stuff I give you? Always love him. Uh -huh. Seems like a rather simple thing to do, doesn't it? Until the thing becomes so important to us, whatever that thing might be, that we find our hands like this when somebody comes up to ask for it. It's mine. No, it never was yours. Matthew 1, 20 to 25. Joseph, stuck in a tough place with a wife who's pregnant, and he didn't do it. And what is he going to do about it? So he was uh, thinking about it. Yeah, I'm sure he was. I'm sure it wasn't a nice intellectual discussion he was having with himself either. He was probably pacing a tent or two. While he thought on these things, behold, the angel Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. Luke one twenty seven. To 32. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. <laughs> yeah. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God. Always a good line to start out with when an angel shows up, because he can show up with a different line. Saul, this day thy kingdom is removed from thee line. So it's always good if an angel shows up, he declares three things to you. One, who he's from. Two, how is it going to deal with you? And three, you know, don't be afraid, stand up.
And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign all over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Angel speaks to one person. Angel speaks to another person. The message the Lord wants delivered to confirm to both of them so they both know what's going on. Okay? Keep that in mind for a second. Acts 11. Acts 11. Peter going to see um, Cornelius. Verse 12. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we went into the man's house. He had it by vision. He showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as, at, as us at the beginning. A man has an angelic visitation that says, Go get these guys, because these guys are going to show you how to get saved. That's remarkable. That's fascinating. And the man was not disobedient to that angel. And not only did his house get saved, got spirit filled the same day. That is remarkable. Now, if God would uh, send a few more angels out on our behalf, we have an innumerable company of them, so that the people we're praying for to get saved would start having visitations and not just mental uh, machinations of trying to figure out whether or not what we told them is true or not, if the Holy Ghost would just show up, our job would become a lot easier. A lot quicker. But they still have to listen to that angel when it shows up. Acts 12, verses 7 to 11 says, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, they came into the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out, and passed on through one street. And forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. He thought he was in a vision. Now think about that for a second. This man is so obedient, he is so much a follower, that if an angel shows up in a vision, in his mind, he thinks it's a vision. He's obedient. You've got to see the marvel of that. His heart was so solid in obedience that the vision had power to him. He just followed him. He did it. And then he discovered it's a real angel, and the angel set him free. If an angel shows up and starts out with, Blessed art thou, or shows up and says, follow me, or shows up and says, be not afraid, or shows up and says, here's the message of the Lord. Your response in your heart shouldn't be, oh, well, I don't follow angels. I try to make sure that I am my own man. Because, you see, Zacharias tried that one. Well, what do you mean? I mean, I, I don't understand. I, I just, I, I don't see how that can happen. Okay, you're dumb for a while. Well, okay, when your child's born, we'll let you talk again. That's the way you don't do it. Revelation one one says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, 
which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And the entire book of Revelation, it's John having this conversation with his angel who's leading him about showing him things. Now remember what I said. Whether in vision or not, we have here a man who is obedient to follow. Let me turn this around a different way for a second and say this. So much of the time, we want to have the gifts. We want the gift of prophecy. We want the gift of word of knowledge. We want the gift of discerning of spirits. But we treat it as if it's a commodity that's in our control to get and have. I want to buy one of those is what we're in essence saying in our heart. What price do I have to pay? Come on, God, let's make an agreement here. What price do I pay to have this gift? Well, how do I work that one into existence? It's one step shy of Simon the Magician saying, how much do I pay so I can have the power to do this giving of the Holy Ghost stuff? Whereas the follower simply follows and God then gives the gifts. Because they are worthy of the gift because they're never going to use it for themselves because they really don't know they don't know better how to mess it up. The church at large lost all the gifts of the Spirit from the inception of the church within a few hundred years. Why? Because they were following God so absolutely perfectly. I don't think so. We call it the Dark Ages because they lost complete contact with anything to do about following God in anything the book said and wrapped it about with traditions galore and in essence fulfilled the verse that says, you shut up the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> the Reformation and the times following, all of a sudden there were men saying, better to obey God than the church. Better to obey God than man. Better to obey God than... And all of a sudden, we have Reformation, Revival, Change, Baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now we're up to, to you know, Neo-Pentecostal. Then we go past that to, you know, Word Faith Movement. Then we go past that to the Prophecy Movement. Now we're going to move past that to the, where are we going? You know, we got deliverance ministries out there with discerning of spirits. we got casting out of devils. We've got healings. We've <clears> got, <throat> and it isn't even the ball, the snowball, that's rolling down the hill headed for that city called the world has no clue. They're clueless. But that ball is getting bigger every year. We're always looking at the destructions. We're always looking at the failures. We're always looking at what's lost. But that's because the followers are the ones who are tucked away in the caves. The followers are the ones who are trying to learn to keep following. That's why God in the Old Testament always says and unto the remnant I will give. Because the other guys who are running the show aren't doing it. We worry about obedience versus disobedience. I think I caught a point out of this message this morning when I was putting it together. Scrap the obedience-disobedience thing. Quit trying to figure out how to obey. What? You can't mean that. Of course I do. You know why? Because while we're busy trying to figure out how to do works, we're missing the whole walk. How hard is it to do the works if you're following somebody? Let me put it to you in perspective. When you were a kid, and you were in high school, and there were these cliques, and there were these groups, and you became part of one of those cliques or those groups, whatever that clique might be, or whatever that group might be, and the persons in that group all made a decision that they wanted to do something. And you were confronted with what is called peer pressure. What happened? Do you know how many kids follow the group? They just follow it. Because they've already cast their lot with the group. When the group moves, they move. The obedience is automatic. When we get to the place 
as we get to the place where our hearts are always in the yes mechanism towards God. Yes, 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 yes. The word no, the word I'm not sure, the word what if, the word about, uh, and all of that, going away, because that is contrary to the word follow. That is contrary to being the soldier who came up to the man of God on his knees. That is contrary to the tenor of Christ, which says, follow me. When we're past all that and we're just followers, the blessings are inevitable. You won't find me one place in this book where the followers got robbed. Who lost out ultimately. You won't find one place in this book where the downturn in a saint's life didn't turn into an upturn somewhere. This book is absolutely clear on how God deals with man. And that's the issue. He is trying to tell us that followers will always be covered by him. Followers will always <coughs> manifest him. Followers have the blessing that others don't get. We're oftentimes in discussions of why is it so-and-so has and some of us have not? And the answer to that is some of them follow their dreams and they never let go no matter what. Some of them follow their plan and they never let go no matter what. Some of them follow their destiny and they never let go of that. Whatever they conceived it to be. And some of them followed their demons and never let go and became what they became. Behold, as one of them. And some of us follow the Lord we won't be deprived either if it's true in a solical natural world that if you stay tight and follow what you're supposed to follow there and it gets you to a conclusion it's a thousand times more true when you're following it in the Lord there's this lie that the devil's put out he's put it out in the world he's putting it out through the media and the lie basically goes like this if you will bow down and worship me, then you'll have all the kingdoms of the world. But if you don't bow down and worship me, you are going to be broke, smashed, smushed, incapable for your entire existence. How arrogant of him. How arrogant of him. When he tempted Christ with that, did Christ not end up with the blessing of the whole world? The very thing the devil was offering him was already offered. He was just trying to change the source. The adversary says, well, you know, if you do these things, then, then I'm going to rise up against you. I'm going to punish you. But he never tells you or reminds you about chariot wheels popping off in the middle of places you're sent to by God. If God calls you up to a closet and says, follow me into the closet, son, daughter, come with me into the closet, and you close the door, you have no idea what storm just brewed outside. And you didn't see it that way. You have no idea what brewed outside. Mm -hmm. The day he said, come into the closet. Because whatever he's about to do to you is going to affect them. Whatever is going to happen to them, you're protected from as long as you're in the closet. That's why Moses, the hand over the cave. That's why Elijah and the other 50s in caves. God always has a place to tuck you away while other things are going on. Followers will find themselves in unusual places. They'll find themselves in unusual needs. But they will always find themselves. You give up your life now, what looks like a loss, your prized son goes up on the altar. And just about the time that you think nobody cares, you're going to hear an angel from heaven speak. And it's going to say, Now I know thou carest more for me than thee. And here's the sacrifice to replace your death. 
Follow me? Christ is our ram in place of what we should have been slain for. Christ is our lamb in place of the sacrifice we were asked for. Do I have to die to self? Well, that depends. Is your self covered in Christ or not? If you're covered in Christ, you're already dead. Now all you have to do is rise up and walk in newness of life. Or to put it another way, follow faithfully. All the imagery of scripture, bury the flesh man in the bottom of the ocean, you know, baptize him in water and sink him. What is that really? That's an image to say to you in a picture, a childlike picture. You know the guy who was always bucking everything? The guy who was murmuring and complaining in the wilderness? The guy that says, oh, the Lord's brought us out here to die. Drown him. Bring up Joshua and Caleb, please. Bring up within yourself the curious Moses who's willing to follow after a burning bush. Bring up within yourself the willingness to follow a pillar of cloud and fire should it show. Bring up in yourself the willingness to follow a man of God or woman of God if necessary when you can clearly see that the Spirit of God is going through that individual. So I've got to discern the spirits. Right. And how are you going to discern it? I'll tell you how to discern it. It's the easiest thing in the world to discern a spirit. Is it, well, how come you don't do it perfectly? I'll answer that. It's the easiest thing in the world to discern a spirit. You know why? My sheep know my voice. Followers know master. People who are bucking and confused and always murmuring and complaining and fussing can't get those voices out of their head. Followers don't have that problem. Somebody may walk up to a man of God and say, well, wh why do you think that God told you to do that, you know? The news are cast are coming up saying, tell us, Pastor so-and-so, tell us, Reverend so-and-so, tell us, Prophet so-and-so, what makes you think God's talking to you? Well, he does. You know what I'm saying? A thousand people in a room and the Holy Ghost falls down and he hits some and he doesn't hit others. I can't indict the others for not being hit. I can certainly point out the ones who got hit. Why did they get hit? Why did the Holy Ghost come down on them? Because he's not uncomfortable with them. Because he's used to them. Because he needs to demonstrate something to them and he knows they're going to follow. Is the love of the truth really that important? Is the love of the truth really so significant? Oh, sure it is. Even Saul, who was killing Christians with a clean conscience, which is, seems like an enigma, was prime candidate for the next step of revelation because he was in heart a follower first. He said, I did this with a clean conscience. I did this thinking I was following you. You've got to see that. He wasn't doing it like some of the other Pharisees who crucified Christ with a bad conscience. They were trying to keep their estate. They crucified him out of envy. They were trying to do it to hold on to their political power and position. They didn't like him moving the whole world. Behold, the whole world goes after him. That wasn't Paul's deal. Paul's deal was, you are blaspheming. And I'm trying to follow you. And why do you let these people live? And he was, therefore, prime candidate. Prime candidate for the visitation of God in a direct manner for the quick conversion of a soul. When we get to the message next time, we'll actually address the scenario where Ananias comes, from, it comes to him. Uh, uh, Ananias? Yes. Because there's obediences all over the place there, too. People who are law-oriented, people who are law-oriented are always worried about disobedience and obedience. Measure and weigh. Measure and weigh. Did I or didn't I? Did I or didn't I? Did you or didn't you? Okay? People who are spirit-oriented are looking for followings. 
their instinct is to look for people who are following. And when a person speaks and says, you know, the other day I was reading the scriptures and the Lord showed me this and the Lord showed me that, to a follower, that's exciting. It perks something up inside. All of a sudden somebody says, yeah, did you hear about these people that got saved over here in Africa? Or saved over here in Kenya? Or saved over here in Britain? Something inside jumps up and goes, wow, that's cool, followers. Brethren, family, we're of the same spirit. There's an automatic symbiosis between followings. Followers. Excuse me. Faith is a thing we all aspire to. Faith gets changed and worked on. But following requires no complexity. If the verse says it, I'll follow it. If the Lord says it, I'll follow him. If the Lord uses you, I'll follow you who follows him. None of that's difficult to a follower. But we are afraid to be even like an Old Testament saint. And yet we've been given an even greater dispensation of the Spirit for following. The net effect of us not following is confusion, not disobedience. Disobedience is an outfruit of setting your will. But the confusion that comes from not following makes you grope. It makes you always looking to try, and you, and you just can't quite get your fingers on it. When you get yourself in the heart and place where you say, Lord, I'm a follower first, and I'll let you teach me how to filter all this stuff out. I'm listening to you. You're speaking to me. I only want to know one thing what's coming out of you. The rest of it's you. I love you. You're great. I like hanging out with you. But my ears are always attuned. I've got a holy vessel sitting in front of me with the fire of God sitting in it, a burning bush that isn't quite lit, and at any second that bush should come on fire, and quite frankly, I better be ready for it if it does. That's my attitude towards the body of Christ. How about yours? I may disagree. I may agree to disagree. I may agree to disagree. But I will always be listening to see whether 5% of what you say is the Holy Ghost all of a sudden coming through saying, here's what I need you to hear. Or 90% of the Holy Ghost is coming through. If we get to the place where we're not afraid to follow, if we get to the place where we at least become Old Testament saints in our way of doing things, we will go further faster than the whole church world is right now. We will be the Joshua's and Caleb's with the power of God manifest, with the gifts of God manifest, with the voice of God clear as a bell. And all of that because we simply followed. I've been asked the question in times past why it was when I tell my testimony in my early years. They say, why, why, why did God speak to you so much? And after a while, I started getting really edgy about it. It was like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's one thing to have people say, well, I'm not sure that's the Lord. I don't have a problem with that. I know what is and what isn't when it is. When it isn't, sometimes I've argued with him so bad that he makes sure that I know that it's him. He's actually come down and said, stop doing that. Verbatim. When I was arguing over a particular vision. It took me three days. He let me argue with him for three days. And out of nowhere, stop doing that. Okay, that's pretty plain. I'll accept that vision as valid. <laughs> He can be that blunt, okay? But I started to feel a little bit uneasy at times, a little bit guilty, a little bit, you know, well, I know, you know, ten brothers in a row. How many get visions this month? <laughs> well, I got two. How many got revelations this month? Well, I got two. You know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? We're always weighing and measuring all this stuff. It's a waste of time. It makes us all feel guilty for what we're trying to do. But I had to come before the Lord and say, and say, you know, why did you do this to me? I mean, I know part of why you did it to me, because you told me early on why you were doing certain things, and I know why you're doing it now, and I understand I yield and I surrender and I try to do my best, and I'm, I have a love of the truth, I really want the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, oh, help me God. But why? What is it? <coughs> How come? You know, it's a big complicated question. And one day he kind of humbled me. And the answer was, basically, summing it up in a, one word, Humble. Now, I would not have thought of that word for me, because I don't think of humble for me. What he meant by that was, when I first came to him, I was just walking around like a kid. I just said, oh, well, if that's what God says, I guess that's good enough for me. And so somebody hands me a book on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and says, here, read this. And I went, oh, okay. 
Well, if I can see the point, it's for me. And that's all I ever did in the early days. So he brings me a vision, and it's like I argue over the vision. Finally he says, stop doing it. I go, fine, okay, that's for me. That simplicity, call it humility, call it humble, but simplicity, that in itself opens you up to a whole lot more in God than anybody else gets. Because he's not, he's not going to destroy you with it. You know, some people get really big-headed when they get too much of God's knowledge. Some people get really big-headed when they get too much of God's Spirit. Some people get really big-headed no matter what. <laughs> but the simple child, that's what Jesus said, the simple child, that's the one who's going to get it. Quit trying to be so adult about it. Kids follow by <clears throat> nature. They do have a flesh man that will throw tantrums also. But in general, they follow. When dad's voice hits a certain tone, you know what I'm saying? When there's a certain line drawn in the sand, son, I've said it once, I've said it twice, and about that time you're going, woo, there's a certain willingness. I mean, come here for a second, son. Not now, dad, I'm playing Nintendo. Bad move. More and more children are becoming disobedient. More and more children are losing the advantage of understanding what true obedience is. They're called the children of disobedience in Scripture. We are not such children. We have an advantage in that we grew up in a time period where obedience was considered normal. We're now moving into a generation where obedience is considered abnormal. Don't fall for the spirit of the age that says, Following is going to destroy you. Rising up and standing on your own haunches, that's what will save you. God has never saved the haughty, the arrogant, the stiff-necked, the proud-faced. He takes the humble and he exalts them. He takes simple people and he exalts them. He takes a fisherman and he exalts them. He can take a scholar like a Paul and exalt them if the heart of the scholar is simple. Simply a follower. We'll talk more about this next week as we go through some more verses and some other categories of followers of what? Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity. We bless your name. Keep working this issue in us, Lord, as we go forward in time. Amen.